Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and welcome to this video on intermolecular forces. So in this video we're going to go through the three types of intermolecular force that you need to know in chemistry and we're also going to look at how we can actually identify uh, an intermolecular force in a molecule and also go through a worked example as well. And not only that, we're also going to show you a, a method uh, which I hope will explain what a van der Waals force actually is, because this is probably one of the most difficult ones to understand what is going on. Okay, so let's start with looking at what the meaning means, so or the meaning of intermolecular forces, should I say. So the meaning inter means between, um, and a bit like intercity, um, intercontinental, etc. So inter means between. And molecular is obviously molecules. So these are forces that exist between molecules. So these are completely different from bonds, which are very, very strong and require lots of energy to break the bonds. Intermolecular forces are, are significantly weaker compared to a bond, and they are different from a bond. So you do need to understand uh, the difference between the two. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the a uh, first type of intermolecular force, and this is called a van der Waals force. Now, van der Waals force, as you can see from here, is the weakest force out of the three that we're going to look at. Uh, and a van der Waals force will exist where you have a molecule or atom that has electrons. So let's face it, that's pretty much nearly every molecule uh, that's around. So van der Waals are pretty common forces. Um, and the idea is, is that um, because they have electrons, they create like a, a, a little dipole between them, and they're also known as temporary dipoles or induced dipoles or London forces. So there's loads of different terms for them as well. So you might see them uh, mentioned elsewhere. Uh, also, the key uh, concept with the van der Waals, which I'll show you what one is in a minute, um, is effectively the bigger the MR of the molecule, the bigger the van der Waals force. So if you've got a molecule that has a larger MR, then it's more likely to have or will have a larger uh, van der Waals force, and therefore its melting and boiling point increases. Now, with intermolecular forces, um, what governs melting and boiling point is the actual type of force that the molecule has. So we'll come on to that when we look at the other three as well. Okay, so let's see what a van der Waals force is. So you can see here I've got some uh, diagrams here, and I've got a non-polar uh, chlorine molecule as an example, so Cl2. Now, normally the electrons are actually spread equally across that molecule. But when another chlorine molecule approaches another chlorine molecule, so we've got two chlorine molecules coming together, something weird happens to the electrons. I'm going to try and explain this using a bowl of water, believe it or not. So I hope this actually uh, works. So you can see here, here's our uh, bowl of water. And you can see what I've done is I've drawn down uh, the like a chlorine molecule uh, on the side of the dish. Now, also what I've done is I have placed uh, some water inside the bowl, and the water is there to symbolize electrons. And you can see here that normally, if it's chlorine on its own, without any further influence, the electrons are evenly spread across the molecule, as you can see there. So let's say, if I just hold this carefully so I don't drop it. Um, so let's say I've got a molecule here. Um, I'll just push it to this side. So we've got our molecule here, and let's say I have another chlorine molecule that approaches from this side. Now this chlorine molecule has uh, electrons as well, as does this one. So because both of them have electrons, we get electron repulsion. So this electron, this chlorine molecule, sorry, approaches it. And what happens is the electrons then shift to one side. So electrons come from here, the chlorine atom comes from here. And so the electrons will then shift to, on this molecule, to that side. And you can see what we have as a result, is you can see we've got chlorine, uh, we've got chlorine atom on this side of the molecule which has loads of electrons you can see the high density of electrons on this side and this chlorine atom actually has a lot less electrons on its side so what we've done is we've created a temporary dipole and the dipole is only there because the chlorine molecule from this side has effectively distorted the electrons so we have more electrons on this side than we do on this side and so what this created is a delta negative chlorine on this side and the delta positive chlorine on this side. So we have an induced dipole. And because we have a delta positive and a delta negative, delta positive and a delta negative, uh, and the same on the other chlorine mo molecule as well, uh, then that means that we have a small attraction between the two molecules. And that small attraction is a van der Waals force. So you can see, as long as it has electrons in it, then you will have this 
temporary dipole and effectively an attraction between one end of the molecule and the other. So let's go back to this diagram. Okay, so you can see here, here's our chlorine atom. We have a delta negative and a delta positive area. So this is where the electrons have been bunched up towards this side. Uh, and as a result, because this is delta positive, the neighboring chlorine molecule then pushes its electrons towards one side where the delta positive is, obviously, because that's where they're attracting. And so this red line here, you can see, it all alternates. This red line is the weak intermolecular force or the van der Waals force that exists between the chlorine molecules. Now, as soon as this chlorine molecule disappears, then these electrons will then shuffle back to how they were before until they come across another chlorine molecule, in which case they'll rearrange again. Now you can imagine in a very crowded space of loads of chlorine molecules, you're always going to have some form of dipole in your molecule. So therefore these forces uh, will always exist at some stage. Okay, so looking at the next type, this is a dipole-dipole force. Now dipole-dipole forces occur in molecules where we have a permanent dipole that exists. So this isn't just a non-polar molecule like chlorine, these ones have a permanent dipole, so they're there irrespective of other molecules around them. So examples of these molecules could be HCl, which we've got there, um, we could have HBr, HF, ammonia, which is NH3, water, H2O. So all these have a permanent dipole. Uh, and this works in exactly the same way, pretty much, as a van der Waals force, uh, except because the dipole exists permanently, uh, the positive end of one molecule will be attracted to the delta negative end of another. Uh, and this attractive force um, is the dipole-dipole interaction. And again, I've drawn the red line in between to show the attractive forces between them. Now, dipole-dipoles are stronger, as you can see over here, than van der Waals forces. Um, so therefore, molecules with these forces will generally have a higher melting point than similar mass molecules that only have van der Waals forces in. Uh, it is important as well, why we've written the word dipole-dipole, it's not because uh, we want to reiterate the point, uh, but when you're in the exam, you must write it as dipole-dipole. You can't just put the word dipole. Uh, and the reason why is it just clarifies the idea that we have a dipole on one molecule and a dipole on the other. And because it's these two uh, dipoles that are coming together, we effectively have an attractive force between them. So um, that is an example of a dipole-dipole molecule. Uh, uh, interaction, shall I say. Uh, the last one is the uh, hydrogen bond. Uh, the hydrogen bond is the strongest intermolecular force out of the uh, three of them that we should know for A-level. So, um, and this applies actually between the three, between hydrogen, as the word would suggest, and uh, the three most electronegative elements in the periodic table. And you can remember it by that's enough, effectively. So the enough bit is the bit that we're really interested in. Uh, which is nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So these are the most electronegative elements in the periodic table. And so therefore, any interaction with hydrogen between any of these three will incur a hydrogen bond. Now, the word hydrogen bond uh, might imply that it's actually a bond, and it's not. This is still a weak force and is significantly weaker than a covalent or ionic bond. So even though it has the word bond in there, don't be fooled into thinking that this is an actual bond. It's still a weak intermolecular force. Okay, so because we're saying that's enough, then it's an interaction between hydrogen and N, O, and F only. So we're looking for molecules with a nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, uh, and it must have a hydrogen as well. So examples of this could be water, H2O, uh, it could be HF, hydrofluoric acid, um, it could be ammonia, NH3, so any of these ones uh, would have hydrogen bonding. Now, one of the key exam questions is for you to draw, uh, using two molecules that we have here, uh, an interaction between the two. Uh, and this is a great mark builder, an easy mark, so you've got to make sure you're ticking every single box to get all the marks that you can. So the first thing we need to do is draw our lone pairs of electrons on the molecule. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to do these in red so it kind of shows up. So here's our uh, water molecule. And now water has two lone pairs of electrons on each of the oxygens. And it is important to show all lone pairs in your molecule if it asks in the question. It just shows clarity and you will need to use them when you're drawing your force as well. So you can see oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. Four of them are lone pairs and the other two are involved in bonding with hydrogen so that's why we have two lone pairs on the oxygen uh, and the next step is then to draw our intermolecular force uh, but actually before that before the intermolecular force uh, we need to draw our dipoles so the dipoles on this 
are delta negative for oxygen, so put that negative in there, delta positive on the hydrogens, delta negative on the oxygen, and delta positive on the hydrogen. Then we now need to draw our force. So our force is an interaction between hydrogen and either NO or F. In this case, it's hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to draw our force and we'll do this in, uh, let's do this in red. Okay, so our force is going to be between hydrogen and oxygen. So it's hydrogen there and the lone pair on the oxygen. Now you can pick any of them really, it doesn't matter. I've just done it because it's just so happens to be uh, drawn like this. But make sure you draw it from the lone pair of electrons to the hydrogen. Okay, the uh, next important point as well is actually, even though water has hydrogen bonding, uh, it also has dipole-dipole and van der Waals forces. It doesn't just have hydrogen bonding. So if it has hydrogen bonding, it will have the previous two above it. Likewise, any molecule with a dipole-dipole, for example, HCl, will have van der Waals forces as well. So all of them will have all three. It's just the strongest intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. So watch out for that in the exam. If, for example, they ask what intermolecular forces are involved uh, between water molecules, you need to mention all three of them. If it asks what is the strongest intermolecular force in between water molecules, you just need to say hydrogen bonding. So watch out really carefully for that in the exam because it could trip people up. So, uh, like I say, be vigilant. And the final thing, the last thing, um, is just looking at some examples of how we can identify uh, and prove that these intermolecular forces exist. Um, we have two molecules here. We have water and methane, which is CH4. They both have very similar MRs, 18 and 16. So that means that in terms of the van der Waals forces, they are very similar. But if you look at the boiling points between the two, Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, whereas methane boils at minus 164 degrees Celsius. There is a massive difference in the boiling points between them. And what is governing this um, difference or the, the, the level of boiling point um, is actually the uh, type of force that we have in methane is only van der Waals. That is the strongest intermolecular force there is. And um, whereas with water, we have hydrogen bonding. So because water has uh, a stronger force, in addition to van der Waals, then its melting point is significantly increased. So this is the explanation behind it. And make sure you're able to link the boiling points of substances to the type of intermolecular forces that they have, because this governs the melting point. And the final point as well is to mention that you don't talk about bonding when we're talking about, uh, or talk about bonds, when we're talking about boiling points and melting points. The only time really when you talk about bonds is when you're talking about breaking up a giant structure. So for example, uh, breaking up a diamond or graphite or breaking up a giant covalent structure or in ionic terms, um, which wouldn't really apply here, uh, you're talking about uh, breaking up an ionic bond, which requires an incredible amount of energy to break up a, a ionic substance, giant ionic substance. So that's the only time when you talk about bonds, breaking bonds and melting points is when you're talking about breaking giant structures. Any other time, simple molecular uh, molecules like this, it's always intermolecular forces, uh, and that's the key thing. Now, if you want to look at videos to do with uh, giant covalent and giant ionic structures, uh, just to um, emphasize that point, then uh, if you click on the links below, and you can have a look at the videos there as well. Um, but other than that, that's your intermolecular forces. Make sure you know all three of them and make sure you're able to answer those questions very, very carefully. That's it now. Bye-bye.